Hi, welcome. So glad that you could join us today from wherever you're watching. You've joined us at the end of a series and this series has been called Good Foundations. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the foundations, the keystone truths that we should be building our lives upon as followers of Jesus Christ. And if you've missed any of the previous weeks, the good news is you can go to our website and to other uh, family church platforms and watch them over and over again. So we've been looking at a couple of keystone truths, specifically grace, righteousness, justification, and the new creation. That's what we've spent our time on over the last few weeks. Now there's other keystone truths that we could speak about like sanctification and the place of repentance in the journey of a believer but I really felt just to focus on these key ones over this series called Good Foundations of Grace, Righteousness and Justification by Faith and the New Creation. I want to finish today by speaking about something that's involved in all of the previous things that we've spoken of. And uh, I want to speak about something that we could call the common denominator. Because when we look at grace, when we look at righteousness and justification by faith, how a man is made right and justified in the sight of God, and, and how we see a person move from new birth into being a new creation, they all include this incredible common denominator called faith. So I thought it would be useful for us today to take a moment at the close of this series just to celebrate faith for what it is, but also realise what it isn't. Now, all the things that we've looked at, justification, righteousness, grace, they all involve or are entered into by faith and indeed faith alone. We taught a couple of weeks ago that it's never faith plus equals, rather sola fide, faith alone. Faith alone in what God has said and what God has done enables us to engage and enter into the fullness of all that he's provided in and through Jesus. Now, here's a couple of examples of that. We've looked over the last few weeks that a person is saved by placing faith in God's grace, his unmerited, undeserved, unearned favour towards us. We also look, number two, that we are fully, not partially, fully justified and made righteous through faith alone, sola fide but also that we're born again into a brand new, new creation experience of life simply by believing on him. So that's what faith is, you see. It's believing in or on him. It's believing in who he says he is and the things that he has said that he has done for us. Don't allow people ever to complicate your faith. You see, faith is always meant to be not childish, but childlike. But sometimes people can overcomplicate something that was ordained or made by God to be very, very simple. Why? So that no one was excluded or left out. God wanted to include everyone. So he designed a faith that enabled any person, whether they were young or old, male or female, Jew or Gentile, independent of where they were from or how they were raised, to be able to engage with him, but also with every good thing that he's done, simply by believing. So we believe that faith, the faith that pleases God, is a childlike faith. Don't allow people to overcomplicate it in your life. Let it be as simple as what it really is. It's belief in God's promises that credits to the account of a person's life the things that he says he has done, provided and given. It's when we choose to put childlike faith, belief, in who he is and the things he said that he's done that God then credits those things to the account of the believer. Now we can look at 
uh, a person that's key to understanding faith. The Bible actually introduces us to him as the father of faith. Obviously, I'm talking about Abraham. Now, we see that Abraham was someone that modelled a faith, a child belief in, a childlike belief in God that pleased God. And we see that Abraham, the one that the Bible says is the father of faith to our life today, we see in him a man that knew how to receive from God the things that God had for him. Let me read to you again from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. It says, what, shall we, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? It says, if in fact Abraham was justified by his works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited or added to him as righteousness. So we see this recipe here that Abraham teaches us that Abraham simply believed God. And when he believed God, believed what God had said to him, God accredited or added to his life the things that were right in his sight. Let's skip down the storyline a little bit further in Romans 14 because we see how Abraham chose to operate in this thing called faith. It says in verses 18 to 24, against all hope. Remember, one of the promises that had been made to Abraham was in his old age, in the old age of Sarah, they would conceive a child called Isaac. And this looked naturally impossible. This looked like it could never happen. He was beyond childbearing years. And not only was Sarah beyond those years also, but the Bible records that she was barren. Everything naturally speaking looked like what God was promising was impossible to come to pass. But Abraham models for us as a father of faith in our life, how we're to approach what seems impossible in natural situations. Let me read on here in verse 18, against all hope. This was a hopeless situation. This looked totally hopeless. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Can you see that all he did was believe? He chose to believe, that's all he did. And so became the father of many nations, just as it was, had been said of him. God had said of him that he would be a father of many nations. Against hope, he had hope. And that which was impossible came to pass. Why? Because God had said it. All Abraham did was choose to believe. Now it says in verse 19, without weakening in his faith, his childlike belief, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. She was barren. Yet he did not waver through unbelief or non-believing regarding what God had promised him, but was strengthened in his belief, in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he'd promised. There we see a beautiful nugget concerning Abraham's faith, that he noticed the natural elements to what was going on in this situation. He saw that his body was old. He knew that Sarah was barren, yet he didn't place belief or hopelessness in those realities, rather in the greater reality that God had spoken to him and his wife that they would have a child. So they actually got strengthened in their faith when they chose to have childlike belief in the things that God had promised. Now this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not just written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness also. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So we see this relationship between Abraham and God and God's promises and the things that God promised came to pass in the life of Abraham even when they seemed impossible. Now what the Bible is revealing to us that we are now because we're children of faith not children that place confidence in works 
We're children of faith. That makes us children of Abraham, those who now relate to God and the salvation he's provided by faith alone. As his children, we now are to simply follow in his footsteps regarding this faith-based relationship with God. Can you see what it was saying in Romans 4 verse 24? The same way that the father of faith, Abraham, operated in regard to believing God is the way that the children of faith, the children of Abraham, that's you and me, are now to relate to God regarding impossible situations or tough situations in our life. The same way that Abraham looked around, made note of what was impossible, but then chose with childlike faith to say, but God, you have promised me a different result. And he saw that different result come into play. What the Bible's encouraging us through the writings of Paul is as children of Abraham now, that's all we've got to do. We've got to walk in the footsteps of Abraham. And as we do, we will see God credit to our life in impossible situations, the things he promised that he would. Now, what are we to do? We're to hear what he has said about a situation. That's why we're always encouraging in family church to be living in the word, reading the word, reading the promises of God for you and for your family. But don't just read them, hear them. Don't just hear them with your natural ears, but hear them deep within you that you know that God has given you a promise for that situation. And when you know you have a promise for the situation, you need to begin to, like Abraham, consider it done, even though everything around you naturally would deny that reality. Now, I always remember my mum was an incredible woman of faith. She's now in glory with the Lord. But people would come to my mum with different situations and different circumstances and they'd be moaning and whining, crying. And, and my mum would always ask them the same question, always. I can remember, I can see her now doing it. She would let them talk for a while and she would say, have you got the promise of God for that situation? And often they would turn around and say, well, no. Um, and mum said, well, what are you doing here? We've got nothing that we can agree upon that's different to what you're facing. And my mum would always make them go away. She would sit with them sometimes and find a promise of God for the situation that they were in or facing. And then she would come into agreement with them and say, well, Lord, you've said in this situation, your revealed will is this. So we choose to be uncomplicated and just put childlike faith. But Lord, you promised it, so it shall be. So we're to follow the model that Abraham, the father of faith, gives us to follow. And as we walk in his footsteps, what does that look like? It looks like us knowing or hearing and knowing the promises of God and then considering those promises um, done and completed, especially when it comes to our salvation and the God-given position he's given us of being now in Christ. When it comes to being saved, when it comes to having a life that's now been placed in Christ, there's no place for feelings. There's no place for how do I feel? Because your feelings can be very deceptive and fickle. Sometimes in the morning when I wake up, feel saved, I don't feel human. But I don't live by feelings. I live by what is real and what is true. God's word and God's promises for you in any situation you're facing, if that word and that promise comes from the Father, his faithfulness backs up that promise. But we've got to learn to say, <clears throat> like Abraham, it may look like my body's had it. It may look like my, my Sarah's womb cannot bear a child. Yet if God has said this and given it to me, not just as a Logos promise, a written promise, but as a Rhema promise, he's made that promise come alive in my heart through the breath of his Holy Spirit. I've actually got to shut off my natural eyes and begin to rejoice and be strengthened by what I see through my spiritual ones. This is the footsteps of faith that Abraham leaves us as a legacy and an encouragement to follow in. Now, faith enters into 
or attaches your life to what has been completed and faith allows you to take full possession of it, full possession of what God has said he's made available to you today. Now we're living in the finished or the done of God. So many of the things that we're believing for, so many of the miracles that we're trusting for, are actually us not asking God to do anything new, but us discovering what he's already done in the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But us then choosing to place childlike, uncomplicated faith in what he's achieved. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for our sin, he died for our sickness, he died for our depression, he died for our anxiety, he died for everything that was authored by the enemy that could disturb us or trouble us in life. You see, salvation doesn't just mean your eternal well-being or your eternal position. It means wholeness, it means wholeness, it means the shalom of God, the wholeness of God in any area of your life that it's needed. You see, Jesus died for your sins. He represented you as the sinner on the cross, but he also died for your sicknesses. For those who fear his name, the Son of God will rise with healings, uh, healing in his wings. That He bore your sins, but also your infirmities upon the cross. Now, what we do is we enter into what's finished to experience it in our now. That's faith. Childlike faith enables us to have a revelation of what's past tense, so it can be now tense in our daily world. Now, a bit of a grammar lesson here. Now, many of you know I didn't really do that great at school, and I've learned a lot of what grammar means and the lenses of grammar um, in, in the later years of my life. But I've learned this more recently about tenses. We understand that there's past tense, there's present tense, and there's future tense. Past tense is about what's happened and gone. Present tense is the now and the future tense is what will be. Now we need to understand that when we're walking by faith in the promises of God, we're walking in the realities of what was past tense to him, but now present tense to us. We experience what he finalised and completed. We're living in the good of what he achieved on the cross. Now, whenever you see in grammar, the word ed at the end of a word. It means past tense, it means it's done, it means you've become what, what had to happen, that something has happened and because it's happened, you've now become. Now we've got to understand this simple grammar shift in our mind when we read the Word of God, that the Word of God has many words with ed at the end of it, which means that, that it's been done, it's been completed. We are the result or we're living in the result of what has already been achieved. It's not something that will be done, it's something that has been done. Let me give you an example, words like saved. We're not being saved, we are saved. Why? Because everything that produced our salvation was past tense. It was achieved by Christ on the cross. Saved, justified, sanctified. Can you see that all of these words finish with ED, which means they're completed things that we can live in the good of or um, ignite in our lives because they're already completed. Now, righteous could be righteous connect righteous that's bad grammar there but we need to understand we shouldn't beg God to do what is already done rather we should enter into the fullness of what is already achieved and any word that ends with ed means that it's already a finished work and you're to wake up in the good of it and live in the good of it like we've been sharing over the last week don't ask God to save what he's already saved. Don't ask God to justify what he's already justified. Don't ask God to sanctify what he's already sanctified. We need to understand the incredible good news of the finished work of the cross, that when a person, young or old, uh, male or female, places childlike faith, belief, in God for salvation, or any other promise that God's given them, we live in the good of what's already been completed and finished, but we make it our reality or our experience by placing belief in that which he has finished. I hope that makes sense today. Your present tense is in accordance or should be in accordance what he has done in the past tense. 
So we look to the cross 2,000 years ago knowing that Jesus hasn't got to die again. Jesus died once for all, for all man, for all sin, for all sickness. Jesus died once for all. So we understand that what has been achieved for us is past tense. Yet we bring the benefits or the blessings of it into our present tense that affect our future tense simply by believing what God has said he's done. So faith really is a key. It connects us to what he's already done. So when we approach what God has promised by faith or with faith, we're connected to the realities of that which is completed and the completed things then find expression in the life of the one who believes. But it also, number two, connects us to him and what he's doing. It's how he calls us to live. Not only does it connect us to what he's done, it can also connect us to what he's doing. Now, how can we speak today about faith without mentioning the key chapter or verses on faith that we find in Hebrews 11. As I read these verses today, let them encourage your heart that faith isn't difficult. Faith is childlike. Faith is a moment where you choose to believe when things around you are agreeing or if they're not agreeing, you choose to believe what God has said as your final authority. So, okay, here's Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> I'm going to read this from the NIV. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and an assurance about what we do not yet see. So faith is the confidence in what we're hoping for, even though we've not yet seen it. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. So it's given us an example of when we approach the universe and the origin of all things. If you try to understand the origin of all things without including belief in God as the creator, you'll end up with many theories. And that's all they are, is theories. While God wants us just to absolutely believe what's true in the beginning, God. And that simple belief helps us to understand how universes were formed. How much more can we understand that of things that seem difficult when we approach them just believing what God has said? Let me read you those verses from the Passion Translation. Now faith, faith has to be now. Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we're longing for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. So faith proves the things that are unseen to be things that will be seen based not on some vague or vain hope but rather on the words that God has given us related to that situation. Okay let's skip down Hebrews 11 now to verse 6. Homework this week, read through Hebrews 11 again. Read about the accomplishments that men and women just like you and me were able to achieve simply by believing in him. It says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let's turn again to the Passion Translation to colour that in a little bit more. And without faith living and active within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who passionately seek him. Hebrews 11 there, the classroom of Hebrews 11 teaches us that without faith, without walking in childlike belief concerning God and his promises, we don't please him. There's no pleasure in how we interact in this relationship with God of believing and seeing things come to pass. But with faith, with childlike belief, being like children that just say, God, Father God, if you said this, it will be so. Number one, that brings pleasure to God, but also brings things that are unseen to being seen, things that are impossible to being possible. So finally, we understand that what we're not teaching today is to have faith 
in faith. Because faith in itself is merely a trigger. It's something that brings you into possession of what God has promised you. So we're not teaching today faith in faith. We're teaching faith in God. But we see that faith, childlike trust and belief, is the thing that connects us to what God has done and is yet to do in our lives. Faith in itself is a trigger. It's a connector. It's what enables us to enter into and access the things that God has promised concerning what he's done and the things that he's promised that he will do for us today. No matter how big that mountain may seem, childlike belief or faith in God causes impossible mountains to be moved. Let me end today by encouraging you with some verses from Matthew and Luke regarding mountain moving faith. It says, he replied to them after the disciples couldn't do the things they wanted to do and seeing a young guy set free from something that was troubling him. Jesus comes and they ask, why couldn't we do what was needed, Jesus? And he says, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. See, it doesn't take a lot of faith. It says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, and he must have been pointing at a mountain at that point, move from here to over there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Notice Jesus doesn't say if you have great faith. He said the problem with what you're experiencing now is your faith is so small. But if you could bring your faith to a place that it was even the size, size of the smallest seed that seeds can be, you'd have the potential to see mountains move from one place to another. Look now how it encourages us in the book of Luke chapter 17. Jesus again says these words, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. So in one gospel, he's saying, you can move mountains by childlike belief in the things that I've promised you. You can see things uprooted, pulled out, maybe diseases or sicknesses, anything that needs to be uprooted. You can see it uprooted and thrown in, in, in a sea of forgetfulness and never seen again, simply by having a mustard seed, small, genuine, childlike faith regarding God and his promises, that we would be those people in Hebrews 11 that approach God in prayer knowing that he is and knowing that he's the rewarder of those who passionately seek him. He's the one who credits to the account of a person the things that they've believed in because God promised they would happen. So let us remember like it says in Mark 9, 23, Jesus says to us today, as he said to those first believers that walked with him, everything is possible for the one who believes. Everything is possible for the one who believes. May we approach him again today with childlike faith, receiving from him every good thing that he's promised us and revealed are available to us in his word. Let's live in our present tense in the good of what he achieved in the past tense. Let's make sure that we're walking with a confidence that we've got ED following the correct words regarding salvation in our life, but we know that we are saved. We have been made righteous. We're justified, we're sanctified, we're blameless now in his sight. Not because of anything that we've done or we were able to achieve, but simply sola fide, through faith and faith alone. I pray you have an amazing week this week. And I want to encourage you, be believing God, be reading the word, be reading the word regarding what God says is available to you as a new covenant believer and begin to say yes Lord like a child like Abraham did all those years ago I simply choose to say 
if you said it, independent of what I'm seeing or sensing through my natural senses, what you've said will come to pass. And I ignite what you've said by simply believing in you. God bless.